Now let's go to part four. We're going to have to move on. Once again, this is, uh, this is loping, galloping through what takes 14 weeks. But let's talk about this nailing it to the now. And I particularly want to talk about lived experience in preaching today. Uh, if you take the, the, say, this deductive framework where you put out at the beginning of a sermon or close to it the big idea, then let's zoom in to every one of these supportive movements. The rhetoricians sometimes use the word seems or seemies, depending on how you pronounce it, but it's a rhetorical unit in a sermon, a package. You move from one to the other. Now, let me change the metaphor and look at those as if it were a kind of a jar. Preaching has to use a good deal of metaphorical language to talk about concept. Into that jar, I want to put these things. And it's not just that. This is what the world church has said preaching is. It's not just some backroom meeting of homiletics professors. This comes from saying, what do great preachers do? Well, they explain the text. I mean, that's those preachers that have lasted the ages had an explanatory function. Uh, that's equivalent to uh, Aristotle's logos, content. You're explaining things in the text. But preaching is not just that. And that's rather bare bones if that's all it is. Along with that, great preachers have put in, I'm going to abbreviate this, L-E, lived experience, formerly known as illustration. Uh, I like to use the word lived experience just to say it differently because so many illustrations have been mal apropos. Lived experience, that is outside the texts, before it or after it, in human lived experience. What is something that sheds light on this text? And I want us to camp out here a bit about the use of lived experience in sermons. Now, first of all, some reasons for it. Isn't the Bible enough? Well, first of all, if you look at people when you're preaching to them, you'll see that after about three minutes in a typical congregation where I preach of explanatory material, three minutes, after about three minutes, look at their eyes. They're starting to wonder. <laughs> Uh, in an exceptional congregation, it may go five minutes. I mean by that, would you please notice the next word in the text is Mesopotamia. <laughs> this is that area between the Tigris-Euphrates valleys. And on and on and on. About three minutes of that, and people began to wonder. There is a sense in contemporary communication in which you have to bring people back to the text by giving them the relief of a lived experience today. And you say, well, it shouldn't be that way. Well, here's where shouldn't doesn't make any difference. The ultimate sin of a communicator is not to communicate. And I can be throwing theological frisbees over their head. And they can sit out there and watch them. Whoa, whoa. He must teach at the seminary. I don't understand him, you know. <laughs> and and I, what have I done if nothing lands anywhere? So lived experience gives the congregation relief, relief from cognitive material, explanatory material. But secondly, it helps you get over the bridge. How do you get out of thenness into nowness? Let's go back to one of my paradigms I've used today. Say Abraham, Ur, Chaldees, Mesopotamia, and I'm saying faith enables you to go without knowing Next, where? And I spend three or four minutes tracing the early career of Abram, Abraham. Across the desert, 600 miles, Terra, leave here, down to Egypt. They're about ready to check out. Yeah. <laughs> so how do I spell relief? I want to take that same organic principle, faith enables you to go without knowing next where. So I may say, there he was walking amidst the rhododendrons and the Shoalhill Douglas estate, Glasgow. <laughs> it's the Lord's Day. Years later, he said he heard a voice 
that said, go west. It's from a working family. If you go west, you had to get on a boat. So he got on the Cameroon, and he said, he said, he said, in his later on, he said, looking back on it, he said, as I th saw the purple hills of Scotland fade, I didn't think I'd ever come back, but I didn't know where I was going. God told him, go west. The only thing that could happen to him was to get a job outside of Newark, New Jersey, digging a ditch. Every word of that is a discouraging statement. <laughs> Newark's a discouraging city. Outside of it is marshland. He was digging a ditch. In the winter, God told him to go dig a ditch? But a men's Bible class at the First Presbyterian Church, Birmingham, Alabama, heard about this young man, sent him to seminary. And he came to Atlanta preaching Christ with a power that nobody had ever seen. People would stand out in the churchyard listening on loudspeakers. Go west. <laughs> Prestigious church of presidents in Washington, D.C. asked him to be their preacher. And he turned them down for a year. Finally, he went to the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. Go west. Then the United States Congress asked him to become their chaplain. The record is people would crowd the galleries just to hear Peter Marshall pray and then go home before they made the laws. And now he belongs to the ages. But he went without knowing where. Now, it's one thing to say that a meandering Mesopotamian did that <laughs> 4,000 years ago. And another thing to say right here in this 20th century, somebody somebody who wound up with great significance in life, went without knowing where. Now, that recovers people's attention to take them to the next biblical exposition, all right? Now, I could go and give reasons. Now, some people will always challenge that and say uh, revered preachers such as John MacArthur, Jr., and, and, and I know John, and we talked about this. I just only use the Bible to illustrate the Bible. The problem is if everybody knew the Bible, that would work. But if I would say, you know, this is just as it was in the days of Habakkuk. <laughs> what do I have to stop and do in the sermon right there? Hmm? More exposition. Now, I've been expounding my text. But if I say, yes, it's like the days of Habakkuk, when God used the enemies of his people to punish his people, then I got to go into Assyrians and all kind of stuff. Ten minutes into that, I'm giving an exposition of a whole other book of the Bible about my text, and the people will take a vacation from my text, <laughs> and they'll never come back to my text. Does that make any sense? So, you know, if people knew the Bible like they did in the Victorian era, you know, I mean, Spurgeon could get up and say, yes, yes, it's like Zechariah, and people had an idea what he was talking about. <sighs> Not today, <laughs> Okay. Now let's talk about some characteristics of good sermon stories. First of all, they need to be credible. Would you underline, underline that, underscore that they need to be believable? There are so many sermon stories that are unbelievable. <laughs> I thought that one of them had died, been given a burial years ago, and it keeps coming back like Dracula. <laughs> Let me tell you, I heard a famous preacher use it not long ago. It's an impossible story. You may have heard it. It's World War I. The men are in the trenches. And the phone line back to headquarters is in no man's land. A bomb drops and it's severed. And one of the doughboys jumps out of the trench and grabs one end of the cable in one hand, one in the other. And the message from headquarters got through, even though it killed him. That's what Calvary is like. I guarantee you, an eight-year-old sitting out there recognizes that's an incredible story. They're sitting there thinking, if I cut the phone line and hold it, nothing's going to go through me. <laughs> I thought that one was dead and gone, and it keeps coming back like Dracula. That's an incredible. Now, let me tell you what gives credibility to sermon stories. Names, dates, places, and details. Make it credible, and its specificity that makes the story credible. And you have the greatest tool in the history of preaching today to find specificity. It's a search engine on the internet. Instead of using some vague, nameless, dateless story floating out here in Never Never Land, you can, you can give credibility 
to your stories as never before. If you even remember part of a story, you can, you can use a search engine to find all of the details about it. Make your stories credible. You know, what, what happens when an athlete is on the way up? Everybody wants that athlete's what for their product? Hmm? Endorsement. Everything about it's a little silly. I mean, here's an athlete standing by a watch or a razor blade. They don't know any more about that than anybody else. But they want a transfer of expertise. Well, if this person is a great golfer, he must know a whole lot about Buick automobiles or whatever. But what's the first thing athletes lose when they get in trouble? Endorsements. Oh, we don't want you anywhere around our product. You're not credible anymore. Now, let me say this about preaching. If you use incredible stories... People in the congregation transfer that to your exposition of the biblical text. So get those right. Make them credible. Make them detailed. It's worth mastering the details of one story rather than three or four just incredible stories. Be credible. And next, they need to be organic. And that is the image of that story needs to grow out of that text, whatever that text is. You're not just telling a story to tell a story. That's the gratuitous use of stories. Well, I'm losing the people. I think I'll tell a joke. No. It needs to be embedded in the image of that text. Now, let me give you some examples of that. Say I'm preaching from 1 Peter 1, uh, uh, you as, or 1 Peter 2. You as living stones are being built up, a holy temple. Now, what's the image there? Living what? Stones. The image in that text is stones. I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to say there's something mighty, magnificent, magnetic about stones. People will go out here and <laughs> stand in the middle of nowhere and look at Stonehenge. Yes, it's like a magnet for the world. What, what are these big stones doing standing here like this? It's, it's a mystery. People go drawn to it. If you go to the north of the United States, there at Mount Rushmore are the faces of presidents carved into stone on a mountainside. Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt. I mean, you can see their face on money. You don't have to go up there to see it. But there's something about a face in stone. Now, I can develop that as an image of living stones. If the image in the sermon is tree. <laughs> Talk about some specific trees. If the image is in contagion, like my Luke 5 sermon. Talk about <laughs> contagion. Let the image of your story grow out of the image in the text. I had to give a graduation sermon seminary. I chose, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us run with, run with endurance, the race that is set before us. Well, the image there is what? Cloud. University had just uh, received, uh, all of us in the university had just received uh, uh, a, a mass email that we could now store things in the cloud. Since cloud is the image, I used any number of images from the word cloud to pull people into the text, you know. It's used poetically. Here's a Wordsworth, wandering lonely as a clown. Here's, uh, I'm on cloud nine. <laughs> so, I used images. We're storing things in the cloud. But here in Hebrews 12, there's an even more significant use of cloud. And that is the invisible church, triumphant, <laughs> witnessing to you as you run your race. You can run it with perseverance. I use the image of cloud for the illustrations. Find the image in the text and let that give you a clue to the illustration. Now, we're going on, on characteristics, but let's talk about finding them and keeping them. Now, I like to use an image, houses without windows and windows without houses. Now, you need to be a window collector not knowing what house it'll go into. <laughs> Every preacher needs to be a collector of stories, and you need a story notebook or a story if you want to write it down on your, on your device, but 
you, you can't, you're not going to remember it. Once again, sharpest pencil better than <laughs> dullest pencil better than sharpest mind. Write it down when it impresses you. And you need to look at life through a homiletic lens. What about the human situation does this story say? Now, it doesn't have to be a story about the church or a saint. It needs to be a story about the human situation. And that's about everything. What does this story say about the human situation? Let me encourage you there, like the vitamin tablet, one a day. If you can capture one a day, you'll build up a lot of windows. Now, it comes from reading. It comes from uh, the side of buses. It comes from signs. It comes from overheard conversations. Don't shut yourself off for any source. Now, let's just talk about your general reading. Your reading needs to be done with an eye to homiletical topic. If you're reading a biography, don't waste that biography. Uh, since uh, since uh, I've been here four and a half months, I've read A.N. Wilson's biography of, uh, of Queen Victoria. I'm now reading a new biography of her son, Edward VII. My soul, every single page in those books, I have written out in the margin the topic that's being discussed in that book. You know, you know Victoria is so famously a widow for so long. <laughs> For the rest of her life at Windsor, it's interesting, Ann Wilson notes, and I've read this elsewhere, she ordered some of the servants to fill the wash basin in his bedroom and to lay out his clothes as if he were about to come back. Huh. Now, there was a prince who had gone on, and <laughs> he's not going to come back. I wonder if we're as ready for a king who's really going to come back. Now, I wrote out in the margin, second coming, <laughs> illustration, don't waste reading. You need to own and mark, or if you read on Kindle or iBooks or whatever, topicalize your reading. You say, well, a lot of this is not about the Bible. That's not the point. It's about the human situation. You know, if you read a story about incredible covetousness, you know, that's, that's good. You know, I read a story the other day about a woman in Miami who had three, three chihuahuas. She left $25 million to three dogs and a staff of seven in a mansion to three dogs. She only left her own son a million dollars. They asked him, what do you think of that? And he said, it all went to the dogs. You know, it, 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 you know incredible lack of stewardship in this kind of world. Now, that doesn't have anything to do with a particular text, but when I preach about stewardship or covetousness, that lady's going to find her way into a sermon. Okay? <laughs> she and the dogs. Okay? All right? So in your reading, now this is finding windows, and you don't know what house they're going to go into. All right? Ask yourself, you know, what is the topic, and when you read books, make a homiletical index in the margin, when you read a newspaper article, sports page, ask yourself, what is the broad topic? Marriage, family, singleness, uh, divorce, remarriage, covetousness, depression, the whole human situation. Mark the stories in the margin of whatever you're reading, called marginalia. I wouldn't give anything for that. Now, if it's in a newspaper, just tear it out. Or if you read on the, if you read, if you read, most of you probably do all of your reading on electronic devices, you know better than I how to mark that and save it and get back to it. But wait a minute. Most of us are in the situation by late in the week of having a house, <laughs> but we need a window. You know, I've got a sermon full of exposition. I'm full of this text, but I don't have a story to use with this text. Well, the Lord has given this generation of preachers something that no generation of preachers has ever had, and that is the topical search engine that is ever more refined in its ability to think how you think. <laughs> and that is where you take the image in the text, put it in a search engine, and seek to find a story that is point or counterpoint 
to whatever you're preaching about. Once again, if, if, it's, if you're preaching against covetousness, own point would be a story about covetousness, a lack of generosity. Counterpoint, which also works, would be a story uh, about liberality, generosity. Now, most of us find ourselves in a position of having houses without windows. Now, it uh, used to be, for those of us who've worked on illustration, we'd have to go to a set of books called the Reader's Guide to Index Periodical Literature. It's very cumbersome to find this kind of story. Today, it is right at your fingertips. Uh, let, me give, let me give you just a challenge here to any homework. Just say you're preaching from John 6, 35. I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Just go play with a search engine. Put in the word bread. Put in the word nutritional value of bread. Put in history of bread. <laughs> You'd be astonished. In fact, the problem is, is not that there's not enough. There's such an embarrassment of riches that you hardly know where to stop. You have to narrow the field down to what does it mean when Jesus said, Ego emi he artes te zoe. I myself am the bread of life. That's an analogy. It's a metaphor. That means stuff about bread helps people understand that. The ubiquity of bread, the nutritional value of bread. In that regard, you can live a long time on bread <laughs> alone. Vitamins, minerals, proteins, fats, so forth. Well, you can discover that when you have a house without windows. Learn how to use the search engine. It's, it's good to have a balance of these. When you discover stories, you know their context. They ripen. They, 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 they get more texture if you found it in your reading. This last minute sort of thing can be done, but it doesn't have the resonance of context if you will keep notes. And let, let me say what Fred Craddock says, and that is challenge you. Just try to find one a day. One a day. Doesn't make any difference. Maybe, maybe on, a, on a sign. It may be from your reading a newspaper. It may be just, just don't do anything without asking what, uh, what about this? Is sometimes just a, you know, a, a, a playbill concert. I, I, I try not to waste any time that. If I go to listen to a symphony, I try to read the life of the artist and how that work came to be, and get, uh, get, get something just sitting there waiting. You can find them on your own. The other day, I was listening to a, uh, a, uh, a, a, a lecture concert on Chopin. And he, uh, he, he would uh, often write one page of music dozens of times. When you look at his original scores, they're so scratched out and redone. And it gave him so much pain that he worked out in a little cottage on his grounds, and he would scream. They would hear him break pencils, break pens. It was, it was painful for him to come up with one page of that beautiful romantic music. But he had the discipline to do it over and over until he got it right. Now, I tore that out, <laughs> the whole page out of the playbill, saved that, put it in a notebook for stories. Don't, it's not that they're not there, it's that we're not looking for them. And the key is this, ask yourself, what does this say about the human situation? It's not a hard question. What does this story say about the human situation? Uh, uh, because all preaching is to people who are in the human situation. Right? So that everything, everything can shed light on Scripture. All right? So try to collect stories, organic stories. Don't put a kite in the tree. You remember this morning? Don't put a kite in the tree, but something that grows out of the exposition of that text, okay? Uh, try to give you a few examples to whet your appetite. I'm in the process of trying to write a book on it and want to, want to finish that. So there you've got stories. So you've got reasons for it, qualities of it, finding them and keeping them. All right? Sermon stories. Now, let's move to the, to the so what factor. I'm talking about what do you put in each one of these moves? A lived experience. Now, the next thing that Great preachers do, and this is one word, it's just a little hackneyed and frayed, application. That is, having heard all of this, the explanation of the scripture, the story, the lived experience, this is the so what factor. 
Now, the best definition of this that I've ever heard in terms of the function of application in preaching is that how can this movement of this sermon either change or reinforce, key words, change or reinforce attitude or behavior? I don't know anything pithier than that to say about this function. A difference between a didactic setting and a preaching setting is the intention of persuasion. How can this change or reinforce? If it's bad, change it. If it's good, reinforce it. If it's internal, that's thought, that's an attitude. If it's external, that's observed behavior. Now, I hope that there will at least be a thrust in every move of a sermon to change or reinforce attitude or behavior. Now, let me tell you how I think that doesn't work, particularly in preaching to, to uh, the contemporary situation. And that is what I just say, ordering people around. Now, this text says pray. You're not a praying people. There's evidence of it in this church. If you prayed, this church would be different. Oh, my goodness, no. No, no, no. Everybody just checked out. I tell you, they just checked out. It's the same thing as this. If you tell a two-year-old, don't, don't touch that beautiful vase on the table. Don't touch it. What happens to that? Huh? That becomes the most important object in life. The two-year-olds think there must really be something to touching vase. No, it doesn't work. Paul said that. He said the problem's not with the law. Remember what Paul said about ordering around? He said, the law says thou shalt not what? Covet. But he said, I didn't know anything about coveting. Until I read that, in so many words, he said, I started to covet everything I saw. Because he said there's a perversity about imperatives when it comes to human life. So then how do you apply things? <laughs> Ask this question of this unit, of this sermon. To whom would it apply? When would it apply? Where would it apply? Okay. How would it apply? Now, this is the personal question. This is the temporal question. This is the question of location. This is the question of modality. Now, you may not answer all of those, but let me give you a, a tip about application. In today's narrative-driven sermon, draw a little picture. Now, this differs from an illustration. It's no time. It's no date. It's just a little picture, a slice of life. Say you're preaching from um, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength. Let's himself be found in trouble. Therefore, we will not. There she is. She's uh, just lost a companion. Six decades. Seldom spent a night alone in her life. Now, three in the morning, she hears things she never heard. Strange noises in the night. Uh, unexplained creaks, cracks in the house. I, and a fear that she never felt before has come into her heart. Is it just this time when this word of God becomes a personal word? God is my refuge and strength. Now, what did I give there? I gave a time. Okay. Right. I gave a circumstance. I gave a place. I gave a little slice of life. You might say, well, look, the church isn't full of... Uh, of uh, widows married 60 years. No, but let me tell you what. People can move from specificity to specificity. They move nowhere from generality. If I just say, you people shouldn't be afraid. If you love Jesus the way I do, you wouldn't be afraid. No, 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 I, no, no, no. <laughs> but if I give them <clears throat> a little slice of life, people can move from specificity 
to specificity. Does that make any sense? Draw a little picture of application. Let them imagine their way into that picture or the parallel, rather than just ordering them around. Yeah. I mean, you get them preach, say a sermon like, Paul's little, sorry, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Live life in an attitude of constant prayer. People need a handle on that. You know, here's a student. First thing is say, uh, you know, it's a primary school student. They think, oh, what do you do? Go around. You look odd all day going around praying, running into people. I mean, they're thinking there's somebody works in a cubicle all day in middle management. Pray. Pray all day. Preacher doesn't have an idea what kind of world I live in. You need to give them a little handle on that. Hmm. Tell the student when it's time to pass from one class to the next. Try for a single day. Don't, don't give people orders forever in application. Forever looks real long. <laughs> Just say for a day. Before you get up and go out in the hall, would you pray one sentence for somebody in front of you or behind you? Just ask God. <laughs> Here you are in a, that cubicle with people who won't do what you're asking them to do, working for you, people screaming at you, working above you. Would, would you do this instead of cursing under your breath? Every encounter you have tomorrow, just one day, would you just say a word of prayer for that person? Now, what you're trying to do there is just give a little slice of life. And I think in application today, rather than ordering people around, ask of this movement, who, when, where, or how. These are journalistic questions. It's the way journalists write. Uh, could this fasten itself to life? Okay. Now, very quickly, as our time is expiring, you've got to start a sermon and you have to stop it. Now, starting and stopping, this is number five here, very quickly. Starting and stopping, introducing it and getting out of it. And uh, time expiring, let me just say this. I think the first word out of your mouth in a sermon in today's church needs to be from the world of nowness rather than the world of thenness. You've been living with that text all week. Uh, it's very real to you in terms of what's happening in that text. Uh, you've, uh, you're immersed in it. Yeah. But if you get up and say the first words out of your mouth today, in 444 B.C., <laughs> the Jewish layman Nehemiah went from Susa, the capital of the Persian Empire, Two, the post-captivity remains of the city of David. I don't know where you preach, but places I preach, it was all over. <laughs> I mean, they were, most people had checked out of that sermon. Is that true? Yes. Do I want to talk about that? Yes. Should that be the first thing out of my mouth? No. All right. I'm thinking about how can I possibly get somebody in 2015 back into a mood to hear about a Jew who built a wall 2,400 years ago. What's the big image in Nehemiah? He's building a what? Wall. I want to get people to think about what? Wall. And I use the word wallness. <laughs> I want to get them in a platonic kind of sense to think about wallness. So the first word out of my mouth is going to be I. It's an experience that's riveted to my mind. Visiting Berlin during the Cold War. Not at the Brandenburg Gate, but out in a suburban neighborhood, I walked up a wooden platform and looked over that ugly wall into East Berlin. It's the only time in my life that looking at something, I saw armed men with binoculars looking back at me, and they unshouldered their automatic weapons. I'll never forget that wall. It's another wall I won't forget. It's in Washington, D.C. It's a, it's a black granite wall with more than 53,000 names on it. They're the uh, American soldiers who died in Vietnam. I've, I've gone there many times, and I, I've watched as they come up. Grandmothers with babies, and they put the baby's fingers on the names on that wall. 
And they write little pieces of paper and jam in a crack in that wall, remembering a teenager whose life ended halfway around the world. That's a wall of memory. The Berlin Wall was a wall of infamy. But you know, there's another kind of wall. <laughs> That's when you build a wall that is a witness to the power of God. And that's what Nehemiah did. Now, let me just ask you this. Would it be better to start talking about walls <laughs> or try to say in 444 B.C.? The moment you say 444 B.C., I mean, you, you, just ask yourself, how many people after church give one another a high five and say, "Woohoo! didn't we not hear about 444 B.C.? There? <laughs> so if I'm going to say anything about the sermon, start, this is the introduction. Start with now. Pull people toward then. You're not going to avoid the text. But in the introduction, start with nowness, pull them toward thenness. That's where I'm going to say. <laughs> you never heard his name. But he built a wall that was more important than any of those walls. He built a wall that held together the city of God until his purposes were fulfilled. When a man named Jesus came through that wall. And then, here is where the big idea comes in the introduction, if you're deductive. At the end of the introduction, pause, pause, full pause, change pace, and change pitch. You, too, can be part of building a wall of witness in this city. Okay. And you put it out there to them. So remember the three elements in the introduction, now, then, and always. This is the big idea. This is what is always true now and then, okay? Does that make sense? Get them into it at the now end of things. Make a game out of it. I mean, sometimes you treat a very obscure text. You have to make a game out of how can I find something now, you know, about this kind of thenness. But just, uh, just work at it and start with specificity of nowness. Now, I uh, said this, uh, this lectures need to, sermons need to conclude, and this lecture needs to conclude. <laughs> Let me just say this, uh, a word about conclusions. If I were to find one aspect of homiletics that even the great preachers challenged with, it's that. It's how do I land this? How do I stop it? Let me say, first of all, it is good to conclude it rather than just stop. Conclusion is intentional. Stopping means you just ran out of time. <laughs> now, if I could use this image in the conclusion, if you've ever taken a magnifying glass <laughs> and caught the rays of the sun to start a fire, you know, or when some of my unregenerate friends when we were in primary school to send some ants into eternal life. Uh, <laughs> uh, I see some of you. You know what I'm talking about. You catch all the rays and you bring it to one, one point. That to me is the image of the conclusion. You're trying to conclude the big idea. You can't conclude everything. What you want to do is in a rhetorically forceful way conclude that big idea. That's what you're concluding. Not just the last thing you said, but for the sermon to stick, you want to conclude the big idea. A great deal more could be said about that. Now, uh, touching on Unit 6 before time is gone, uh, and that is two big, broad aspects of delivery, because a sermon's not a sermon until it's spoken. <laughs> Let me just hand this to you to consider. Delivery is both nonverbal and verbal. Nonverbal delivery is everything other than your vocal production. It includes eye contact. The single most important aspect of delivered speech is eye contact. 
Am I preaching to a piece of paper? I'm so excited about the gospel. <laughs> All kind of devices preachers have, uh, you know, have used to try to keep eye contact. We when heard about one, I never saw him. He, he actually penned his notes inside his, inside of his lapel. You know, he said God created a man, named him <laughs> Adam. Adam was lonely in the garden. God took from one of his ribs and made him a companion. <laughs> Eve. And yet in their coming together, God intended them to be progenitors of the human race. So they had a son and named him <laughs> Brooks Brothers. No, what? That's not, <laughs> you know. Uh, Seek to be free enough from manuscript, notes, or outline that you maintain eye contact. Now, some homileticians strictly make their preachers preach without notes. I, I, to me, that is an element of indifference in it as long as you maintain eye contact. I've seen full manuscript preachers who can engage people, but the key is look at people. Recognize that nonverbal delivery trumps verbal. And what I mean by that, by aspect of face, particularly facial impact, and sometimes gesture, you can trump what you're saying. Now, we all know this. We just don't think about it much. If I say, I want you to understand, Jesus loves you. He came to save you. <laughs> no, no, nobody gonna believe. <laughs> believe he's a boxer. <laughs> His left jab. <laughs> I mean, be conscious that gesture. It's 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 it just makes sense. If you're saying, "Come to me," come to me. Use an embracing gesture. You know. If you're saying, depart from me, use a dismissive gesture. I mean, nonverbal counts. <laughs> you know, and, and, and you can read one of the funniest. Let me just read this. One of the funniest things I've ever read in homiletics. Since Spurgeon's great classic, Lectures to My Students, delivered at Spurgeon's College in the 1880s. He'd go on Friday afternoon, lecture to his college students. And the chapter on gestures is one of the funniest things I've ever read. I mean, it's just hilarious. He, he says, he said, I saw one brother whose only gesture was a saw-like gesture. He said, if you had put a saw in his hand, he would have sawed his way through every pulpit in England. You know, because the only gesture. There are varieties of gestures. You can study it. Gestures up here are transcendent. Gestures... At a lower level, or dismissive. There's all. There's a science of gesture. University of California, Berkeley. It's literally gestured, even with hand gestures, what they connote. Very quickly, verbal. Pace, pitch. Remember the P's. Pace, pitch, pause, projection. Pace, pitch, pause, projection. Now, projection, I put at the bottom because that's the foundation. And that is originating speech, not from shallow clavicular breathing, but from diaphragmatic breathing. And if you've ever had any extent of music lessons, know that what? Diaphragmatic breathing. Clavicular breathing is shallow, nervous, panting dog-like breathing. Diaphragmatic breathing is filling your lungs with air in order to throw your voice forward. And even though we have amplification, that's still important to do. Much to, you can read about all this. This is in basic books. Now, pace has to do with varying the rate of delivery. By actual studies, people tend to like to hear 
English speech at about 170 words per minute. Now, above that, beneath that, they get uh, a little bit out of it. You need to vary pace. When you're explaining, slow down. When you're in narrative anecdote, speed up. Now, along with that is pitch, and that is where your voice falls on a scale. Al Faisal, in his Guide to Self-Improvement in Sermon Delivery, says you can actually go to, to a piano and find out about where your range is. If you're tone, tone deaf, somebody can help you. You have the capacity to go an octave above that and an octave beneath that. Very few preachers use range. I work on it in my preaching labs where students preach sermons all the time. One of the things, major things I note is, will you please explore your range? Rather than just, now the deadliest combination is not varying pace or pitch. We've gathered together here today to consider <laughs> the importance of this gospel passage. Now there is in, sometimes in high church, uh, what I call the Beethoven's fifth Ta -da -ta -da -da. It's this somewhat detached sound. I want you to consider what Jesus has done in the message today. Da -da -da -da. Da -da -da -da. It's an attempt to sound understated by some clerics. It's, I call it the Beethoven's fifth delivery. Instead of inflection at the end, which you'd normally do if you were excited, they, hmm, da -da -da -da. it's an effort to sound detached clinical, remote. I know this is important, but it doesn't matter to me enough. <laughs> <You know. laughs> kind of the ecclesiastical whine. Da, 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 da. Nobody talks that way. I, I, I say, what if you drove through a drive through at McDonald's and said, give me a number one. <laughs> Would you supersize it? <laughs> You know, very pace and pitch and pause. Some of us abhor any dead air in a sermon. When you are moving from one movement to another in a sermon, pause. Not only is it true that faith enables you to go without knowing where, pause. <laughs> but also, faith enables you to wait without knowing when. Pause. You need to signpost it. I, I, literally, uh, I literally draw a paw on my students' papers. Pause. Uh, uh, here. And I, I have them, I know this is real simple, but I have them draw in a paw to pause here because first it helps you. You recollect where you are, but it helps the church. They don't know your argument. They don't know the next signpost in your message. At critical seams, pause. Now here's a clue about pausing. You will have paused long enough when it seems too long for you. Let me say that again. You will have paused long enough when it seems too long for you. Your perception of the pause is not the church's. You want to get on with it. You know what's next. It'll be about right for them. And I, I here in 50 years of trying this, I still, at critical junctions, will say to myself, 1001, 1002, 1003, to make myself pause. Okay? Well, let's do this. Um, Get your arms, let's go back to the original paradigm this morning. This is what I like to do. Thenness, nowness. Wasness, isness. Thereness, hereness. Everything I've tried to say during these hours fits into that paradigm. Your study, finding the big idea, structure, even delivery, is all intended to help you stand between then and now, holding in one hand the past biblical revelation, in the other hand the current human situation, and bringing them together in the speech event 
That is preaching. Let me leave you with this. Preaching is inherently worthwhile. Down here at the uh, Royal Albert Hall, whichever way I'm supposed to point, <laughs> at 8 o'clock, if they're playing a Beethoven symphony, the conductor comes out. He doesn't turn around and count the crowd and say, well, you know, this isn't worth it. <laughs> no, at 8 o'clock, the baton drops because it is inherently worthy to be performed. And I would like to exhort you this. Preaching in the church is an inherently worthy thing to be done. God bless you in the doing of it. Thank you.